Hey guys, welcome back to the next session of the CFI oral exam. We're gonna jump right into it here, but first, make sure you click on those links right below the video here. Print out that PDF sheet. That is your cheat sheet to this session of the CFI oral exam. Everything you need to know on there as we follow through with this video. You wanna make sure you're listening, you're watching, you're writing things down on that little cheat sheet to help you take some notes, engage all those senses. I know, this is kind of not the most engaging, most interesting material in the world. So we're trying to make it engaging, trying to make it engaging for yourself so you can retain all this information. Again, thank you so much to Lufthansa Aviation Training USA out here in Goodyear, Arizona for making these videos possible, for making this whole series possible. If you guys are looking for a place to become a CFI, a great place to work as a CFI once you have a little bit of time in your book, go ahead and check them out. Awesome place, great benefits. And other than that, let's go right back into the CFI oral exam. So now we're gonna move on to responsibilities as a CFI. We'll be using the scenario of a 15 year old kid who wants to begin flight training, mm -hmm. and that'll be the, the uh, remainder of the oral will be based on that. I have many simple questions, but some of the questions will be scenario based, as I want you to take me through what you would do to train the student from zero to commercial pilot, not including an instrument rating. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. All right, so we'll start with some of the simple questions. Mm -hmm. As an active flight instructor, what does the TSA, TSA require you to do before start you start flight training a U.S. flight student? Uh, so with a U.S. flight student, uh, you would need to verify citizenship. And you kind of get like one free pass, so to speak, one flight lesson, where you could take them out on discovery flight mm -hmm. uh, without really doing any sort of background or verification there. Uh, but after that, if you're going to provide more flight instruction, you need to verify citizenship. A passport's good, birth mm -hmm. certificate's good, and uh, you would log that uh, as an endorsement in the back of their logbook that you verified citizenship. And that's pretty much the extent of it. For a uh, U.S. citizen, a foreign flight student, you would have to go through uh, the TSA uh, alien flight AF alien flight program okay. thing. <laughs> uh, you'd have to go through that website, apply mm -hmm. as a flight instructor, uh, have them apply, they'll submit fingerprints, do the background check, they mm -hmm. pay like a $150 one-time fee, eventually you get approval, and then you're approved to train that student in that airplane for a set period of time. Okay. So uh, that's how you would have to go about it with that. Okay. And who is required to complete security awareness training? So security awareness training uh, is basically required by the TSA for CFI, so anyone who's going to be teaching has to uh, complete that. And that's, I believe, annually. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's a simple course. You can go on AOPA and they offer it for free and it takes 15, 20, 30 minutes. You go through, you get the certificate, you print it out, and you're good for that year. Okay. How, when do you have to have it complete? Uh, I believe the rule is you have to have it completed within 60 days of date of hire. So if you get hired at a flight school, mm -hmm. uh, then within 60 days of your uh, date of employment, you have to complete that security awareness training. Good. Okay. Um, do the requirements for citizenship verification apply to flight reviews, instrument proficiency checks, and aircraft checkouts? Oh, so if I'm going to do like a flight review, um, or if I get my double line and do an IPC, or I'm just doing a runner checkout, it's not considered flight training because that person's already a pilot, so mm -hmm. it's more like the initial flight training is when you'd have to do it. So even if they're not a U.S. citizen, but they already hold you know, an FAA private, then that's kind of good enough for me. So I don't really have, once somebody comes to me with a private or better, then I don't really have to do any sort of verification as far as citizenship. Good. Okay. So um, what endorsements would you, our students need prior to solo? Prior to solo, uh, they're going to have to have the endorsement for the, uh, the written exam or the pre-solo test. They're going to have to be endorsed that they're competent in that make and model aircraft for a solo flight. And any endorsements that would be required for operating that particular aircraft. So what airplane would our student be using? A Cirrus? Sure. <laughs> so like a Cirrus SR-20, um, it's a high performance aircraft. It's over 200 horse. Yes. Oh, wait, it's at two, it, yeah, this, these are 215. 215, okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, over 200 horsepower, they would need the high performance endorsement, mm -hmm. and you'd have to complete the training with, uh, that goes along with that. Okay. Uh, it's not retractable. It's not complex. So they wouldn't need anything like that. It's not tail wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, and we used to endorse the back of the medicals. Now we don't. Uh, they have the student pilot certificate. 
And basically, I would just refer to AC 61, 65, <laughs> whatever rendition we're on now. I believe the last one I saw was G, but mm -hmm. it keeps changing. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, when I first became a CFI, I think we were on like C. Yeah, <laughs> C or D yeah. or something. It was a while ago. <laughs> Uh, so refer to the most current rendition of AC 6165. They'll walk me through all those endorsements for a pre-solo student. Okay. And you brought up a student pilot certificate. How do we do that today? So a student pilot certificate is done through IACRA mm -hmm. now. Uh, it used to be just when you got the medical, the back of the medical was the student pilot certificate. Mm -hmm. Now you can take anyone and put them through IACRA mm -hmm. and uh, it wants them to be 16. If they happen to be trying to solo on their 16th birthday, there's you could call up 760. I believe there's a way to uh, to put the paperwork through so they will have the student pilot certificate, in fact, on the date of their 16th birthday, so they could do that sweet 16 solo. Okay. Um, but, uh, yes, everything's done through IACRA. They'll get a plastic card in the mail a few weeks later, just like a regular pilot certificate. Okay. And that's good forever. It doesn't have an expiration date anymore. Okay. Uh, the medicals, you know, the student pilot certificate expired along with the medical. Right. So now the, the CFI is doing it instead of the medical examiner. Do you know why? Uh, that way you can actually verify identity and put, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of go through a background check, so to speak, through IACRA uh, when you put in... They're in, somebody else verifies their identity, right. ultimately. We just put in all yes. the information. And with students whose English is not their first language, we need mm -hmm. to verify that they... Yes, they are actually English proficient. Right. So uh, when you check off that student pilot certificate box, so to speak, in Accra, you're verifying that they meet the English language standard. Okay. Sometimes it's an issue we have here, so... <laughs> yes. Um, all right, so uh, you already mentioned that one. How, how long until... A student pilot would have to do a flight review. Uh, a student pilot would never have to do a flight review. Okay. Uh, they would just need to be re-endorsed for solo flight, and there's no flight review if they're just coming back to fly with an instructor on board. Okay. Uh, so there wouldn't be one for a student okay. pilot. Quite the right, right the question. Um, how long is the temporary certificate valid once the student passes the check grade? Uh, that would be 120 days. So um, if they don't have it, you know, within. 80, 90 dish days, call AFS 760, start looking into it, see what's going on with their application. If it got hung up somewhere, mm -hmm. if you know something, their name on their driver's license didn't perfectly match the name on their written exam or something like that. Right. So, do you need a flight review to instruct? Uh, so, I would need a flight review just as a normal pilot if I'm going to act as PIC. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't necessarily have to be PIC to be instructing. So, if someone else was already a private pilot and they agreed to be PIC for the flight, then I could provide, say, a flight review uh, or an instruction without mm -hmm. legally being PIC for the flight. So I may not have a current medical or uh, flight review, but I could still instruct as long as my CFI certificate was valid. Good. So how long is your CFI certificate valid for? Uh, it's valid for 24 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, basically from the date you receive it, and then you can renew it uh, within three months of the expiration date. You could renew it for another 24 months based off the number of students you've signed off. If you meet the minimum in 61, 187, or 61, 197, uh, mm -hmm. maybe? 189, maybe. 189, uh, okay. That's uh, okay. maybe. <laughs> and uh, that sounds accurate. Uh, other way, in Part 61, we could refer to that. It'll tell us when we, uh, what criteria we have to meet to be able to renew the certificate. Okay. And uh, basically, off student sign-offs, off of completing an in-person renewal course, mm -hmm. completing a online renewal course, an eFERC, mm -hmm. uh, flight instructor renewal course, or simply just. Uh, you know, taking an additional check ride, say adding your double I or adding your MEI, kind of resets that clock. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. All right. So, um, what records do you have to keep for your student? So, records that I would have to keep. So, for our 15 year old student, uh, I would be keeping records of who I endorse for solo flight. Mm -hmm. So, that would be uh, basically, you know, the solo endorsements. I would have the. Uh, the endorsement for the written exam, a record if he passed or failed it. Uh, I would have the uh, endorsements in the records of uh, endorsing him for the actual check ride. And just, I mean, personally, I would keep a record of all the training I did with him, mm -hmm. but just the legal bare minimum. Uh, 
basically just uh, those endorsements is what I need to keep track of and okay. the results of the pass fail test. And I believe that's for three years okay. uh, mm -hmm. after you're finished with the student. Okay. So what do you have to log in your student's logbook? In your student's logbook, you're going to need to sign it every time you give flight instruction. And you're going to have to log uh, basically what's required in part 61, 51 maybe of logbooks, where mm -hmm. it describes the date, the aircraft registration, uh, the remarks of the flight, uh, the flight time, uh, those bare minimum criteria must be in the logbook. Mm -hmm. Most logbooks meet that criteria or exceed it with a few other line entries, but just because a logbook came from ASA or Glime or whoever doesn't mean that it's proper. There may be a okay. column missing or something, so you want to verify that back with the regs. Okay. And in your logbook, do you have to log anything for your student? Um, I don't actually have to put anything in my logbook aside from those records that we had discussed. Right. Um, if I don't want to log the flight time, mm -hmm. uh, it may sound bad. I just don't care anymore. <laughs> like the airplane doesn't care how many hours I have, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter when you tell people how many hours you have. They don't really care either. So um, <laughs> once I've hit my fifteen hundred, I've got my ATP. I'm mm -hmm. done logging time for the most part, other than what's legally required for me to operate as PIC. So I log my three takeoffs and landings every ninety days and things like that. Good. Okay. How would you obtain an appropriate medical certificate? Uh, so uh, for the student or for myself, um, mm -hmm. how I would direct them is basically to go on you know the FAA website, go to the AME locator, mm -hmm. type in their zip code, look for AMEs in the area. Uh, I know of a few locally that I could refer them to and then kind of guide them through filling out the uh, medical application and uh, the acronym for that escapes me at the moment. MedExpress. MedExpress, <laughs> yes, that acronym. Mm -hmm. It's yes. not an acronym. Uh, MedExpress, mm -hmm. and they'll get their confirmation number. They'll give that to the receptionist when they book the appointment with the AME. And it try to I mean, guide them to the appropriate medical certificate they need. Uh, you could have them get a first class mm -hmm. if they want to go the airline track, uh, to make sure that there's nothing wrong with them. But a third class is more than sufficient for all of your flight training through commercial and CFI. For a 15 year old? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, how would you get a medical certificate in the event of a possible medical deficiency? Um, say somebody is missing some fingers, um, missing some toes, missing an arm, uh, has something slightly amiss with them, uh, call the AME, discuss it with them. Mm -hmm. uh, you could call FISDO and talk to someone who's familiar with SOTAs, so a st statement of demonstrated ability, mm -hmm. uh, where you might train the student, you know, mm -hmm. for 10, 15 hours, get them ready to solo, and then they might go fly with a, an examiner from the FISDO mm -hmm. who will determine that, yes, he's missing some fingers, but he can work the flight controls and operate the aircraft safely, no problem. And they give them a statement of demonstrability that he's good to go and he can get a, uh, a regular medical. What about if it was something like uh, high blood pressure? Uh, so something like high blood pressure would be, I would defer to the AME on it. There, sometimes there can be special issues medicals. Okay. Um, there may be special criteria or limitations they place on the medical where I've seen somebody with a second class medical that was only valid uh, for second class privileges when they were accompanied by another pilot. Mm -hmm. um, so they had to always be part of a two man crew unless they were flying with third class privileges and they could fly by themselves and their Cessna 172. Uh, but sometimes I think that gentleman had a pig heart um, mm -hmm. installed. So there's workarounds that um, Oak City, the doctors there, and your local AME can, can find to help you achieve a medical certificate. Yeah. Uh, you just don't want to be denied for it <laughs> up front. Right. So once you're denied, it's a little tougher. So you want to help them work through those problems before actually really applying for the medical and getting the denial. Good. Okay. So um, let's talk about some medical factors, some causes, mm -hmm. symptoms, effects, corrective actions. Sure. So let's start with hypoxia. Uh, so hypoxia is basically, there's a couple different types. Most common thing is just going to be you're flying too high, the air is too thin, you're not getting enough oxygen. Okay. Uh, fingertips turn blue, lips turn blue, feel a little drunk. Mm -hmm. uh, symptoms are different for everyone, so it's nice if you could ever have the opportunity to take students to like a high altitude chamber uh, where you could put them in a semi-hypoxic state and they could recognize those symptoms in themselves. Um, but typically it's going to be due to too much altitude. It could be due to a medical problem where their lungs just aren't taking in enough oxygen. It could be a drug they're on that 
is preventing oxygen absorption of the blood, but typically it's just flying too high and you need to fly a little lower. Okay, how about hyperventilation? Hyperventilation is breathing rapidly in a stressful situation, common in flight training or <laughs> post-flight training. Uh, you just start breathing too much and you wind up breathing so much with that rapid heart rate and everything that you actually have a lack of carbon dioxide in the blood. So okay. you're exhaling so much, you're dumping all that CO2 and uh, you know it gives you similar symptoms you know to uh, hypoxia sometimes it's just you're not going to be able to function well mm -hmm. the um, a solution that could be breathing into like a brown paper bag trying to restore and recycle some of that air so that you restore those levels of co2 the best thing is just calm down mm -hmm. and <laughs> breathe deep and slow mm -hmm. good how about middle ear or sinus problems Middle ear sinus problems, um, flying with a cold, mm -hmm. um, going up can hurt, coming mm -hmm. down can hurt a lot, lot more. The air will escape as you go up and then your ear sort of, I guess the best way it would be to draw it a little bit. So pardon my weird head. <laughs> uh, but with the ear, we have this opening here and it's this, through this thin little tube called the estuarine tube. Mm -hmm. And then there's a little pocket of air here. And that pocket of air, as the pressure drops over here, so we have low pressure, that air is going to become high pressure and, and hurt a little bit. And it's going to squeeze out and kind of go through this tube. The tube normally is almost shut nearly. And if there's any sort of fluid in there, it will basically effectively close it off. There's usually a little bit of space, but with any sort of fluid or congestion, it'll close off that tube. The air might be able to kind of bubble out. Mm -hmm. And then as you descend and this becomes a high pressure and it tries to push back through, it just closes it even tighter. And so now you got a lot of pressure pushing against that and it really hurts. And uh, it could rupture your eardrum. It could really affect your hearing. Uh, the best thing to do would be to try to go back up and then descend slower, try to have them clear their ears, try to swallow. As you swallow it, it kind of pulls down on these parts here and pulls that tube open to allow for uh, for air to uh, you know equalize between the two. You could even try, like worst case scenario, exhaling with your uh, nose pinched to try to equalize <laughs> the pressure. Uh, so ultimately the best yeah. thing to do uh, would be to either with the student go back up and then have them try to equalize. The really best thing is don't fly when you're congested. Make sure your passengers are congested when you're flying in an unpressurized airplane. Uh, be aware of the cabin altitude you're going up to, and uh, you know if it, they teach your students that if they have a passenger that this happens to, go back up, descend slower. At the end of the day, at some point you have to land. So if mm -hmm. it's it really bad and they just can't clear their ears and they're in extraordinary pain, the eardrum will eventually rupture and the pain will kind of go away right. as the pressure equalizes and a little bit of blood drips out. Mm -hmm. I've had that happen to me and the hearing goes away for a couple of weeks depending on the severity and then it comes back. Mm -hmm. um, it's more important to land and let your eardrum heal over a few weeks than it is to run out of gas right. trying to solve this problem. <laughs> Good. Okay. How about spatial disorientation? Mm, sorry. Okay. Uh, spatial disorientation. A number of different ways we could get into this. Um, I could probably make a whole lesson on spatial disorientation, mm -hmm. and uh, I would take you to uh, you know a lesson I have here as part of my EFB or part of my CFI notebook that walks you through basically all the illusions you could get into, especially at night or even in the daytime. If you're if you go VFR and IMC would be a really big example of spatial disorientation. Mm -hmm. uh, practicing with students under the hood kind of helps train them for that. Uh, letting them understand the associations with how they might accelerate and then that translates into a pitching up motion um, or if they decelerate it translates into them thinking that they're pitching down even though they're not and trying to make them experience those illusions while they're under the hood mm -hmm. uh, saying what are we doing now you know oh we're straight and level and then have them take the hood off and see that in fact they're in a you know 30 or 40 degree bank uh, would probably be a great way to demonstrate that and in preparation for like a spatial disorientation lesson, I would assign them homework, assign them a few videos, uh, then have them watch those, come back in. We would go through the lesson together on the ground school, review any questions they had, go out and do, and then assign them a little bit of study homework as well. At night, you have the runway illusions, mm -hmm. uh, and I have videos that kind of show that, you know, coming into a very narrow runway at night makes you feel like you're higher than you really are, so you might wind up being lower than you want to be. Coming mm -hmm. into a really wide runway at night makes you feel like you're low, so then you wind up you know, flying a higher approach. Uh, the 
coming into a down sloping runway or an up sloping runway, how that would affect you on approach. And uh, basically just trying to, you want to create and make it real and make it scenario based. Mm -hmm. So you want to create a scenario where they might get into these, uh, you know, possible spatial disorientation moments and show them when they're going to possibly experience them and then try to make them feel that in the airplane and really get them to that experience so they can recognize it themselves when they're out there on their own. Okay. Could that happen just from the middle ear sinus problems possible? It certainly could. The inner ear will play a lot of uh, tricks on you as mm -hmm. far as your balance. We rely on the fluid in our inner ear to kind of tell us where our balance is. Mm -hmm. So having congestion even could mess with you as far as what you feel your equilibrium is and as the pressure changes could really affect that as well. Good. Okay. Uh, how about carbon monoxide poisoning? So carbon monoxide poisoning uh, most often is going to be from exhaust getting into the cockpit. Most often it's going to be from running the cabin heater with mm -hmm. a cracked exhaust manifold and the shroud is then capturing exhaust and feeding that into uh, the cockpit rather than just hot air. Best way to handle that would just be turn off the heater, open the windows, get that CO out of there ASAP. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me, my throat gets a little bit sore. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a little bit of a headache, smells kind of exhaust. Like carbon mm -hmm. monoxide itself has no odor, but because it's associated with exhaust from the engine, you'll have that airplane leady, oily smell mm -hmm. uh, in the cockpit a little bit that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, similar to hypoxia, everyone's symptoms vary, but typically nausea, headache, for me, that kind of raspy throat, uh, mm -hmm. the exhaust seems to irritate it, uh, is a big cue that we're getting CO in the cockpit. Okay. Maybe land as soon as possible. Yeah, landing <laughs> as soon as possible would also okay. be a terrific thing to do at that point. All right. So how would fatigue and stress affect? Fatigue and stress, um, fatigue's like a factor in almost every accident ever. Mm -hmm. uh, people just not being at 100%, rather they may have just flown a lot that day or they could have been fatigued leading up to it. Two different types of fatigue. We have acute fatigue and chronic fatigue. Basically acute fatigue is I didn't sleep well last night and chronic fatigue is I haven't slept well in weeks. Mm -hmm. um, acute fatigue, you might recover from in a day or two or three of good sleep and chronic fatigue could take a very long time to recover from. There's a lot of things associated with fatigue, like overly optimistic decision-making uh, when you're very tired, uh, delayed motor skills, delayed reaction time, and it, the fact that the most insidious thing is you don't really feel fatigue. Sometimes you feel even better or you feel alert, but you just don't realize that you are impaired a little bit, almost the same as being impaired by alcohol. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to just kind of be honest with yourself about your how well you've been resting, You know, even if you've been getting hours of sleep, it may not be good hours of sleep if you have a lot going on in your life that's stressful, like you know, problems at work, problems with the relationship, uh, financial problems, whatever it might be, can be affecting the quality of the sleep. So you might be getting the eight or nine hours or seven or whatever you need as a person, but it's not quality enough and it leads to chronic fatigue down the road uh, that will really affect you flying. So if the student's fatigued or uh, they shouldn't really be flight training mm -hmm. and if they have any of those problems, outside problems affecting, it's your responsibility to help them realize that that's what's affecting their sleep and uh, try to remedy that for them, try to teach them this skill so they can handle it later on in life. Because at some point, you're gonna have a little bit of stress in your life. Okay, yes, and stress is, is yeah, it's such a catch-all phrase, mm -hmm. and it's sometimes hard to recognize. So for our 15-year-old, yeah, trying to, <laughs> it's tough to explain that to a 15 year old, yeah. um, but you do your best and, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, it comes with age a little bit too that you figure right. out. So here in the desert, we have an issue with dehydration, mm -hmm. <laughs> as we yes. know. So let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I go through way more water here than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, dehydration, it goes back to Maslow's hierarchy, very bottom there. Yeah. We need food, water, sleep to be able to learn and be able to operate as human beings. So you've got to have water with you. So what I do, I kind of have like a little sheet I give to students of, you know, your, when you go to your college class, your first day and the professor gives you the syllabus for the quarter or for mm -hmm. the semester and gives you what you need to be successful in their course. I try to do the same thing with my students where I'm going to give them this little sheet that says, one of the things you need is a flight bag. And in that flight bag, there should be two small bottles of water, two granola bars, uh, kind of the bare necessities mm -hmm. of, hey, we're going to be flying and 
you need to always have water and always have some sort of food because you're going to be rushing from work to get here in time for the flight lesson <laughs> and you want to have time to stop and grab a bottle of water or stop and eat so at least eat the granola bar to meet that basic you know need at the bottom of the pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy good okay um, how about the effects of alcohol and drugs and their relationship to flight safety so uh, alcohol is bad mm-hmm. so are drugs mm-hmm. um, and not just drugs but over-the-counter meds uh, OTCs can really affect you as well the we FA has we can focus more on that because that's what your 15 year old might be more have more access to <laughs> sure so um, with just regular over-the-counter meds hopefully mm-hmm. his parents are monitoring that in some way or shape or form but your normal doctor may not your normal family doctor may not even have the answers to this they may say oh that's fine for flying or for mm-hmm. operating machinery the FA is ultimately who gets to make the call on this sort of stuff mm-hmm. so Looking at the uh, you know the FA approved medication list would be a great place to start on the website. Mm-hmm. If the med isn't approved, then call the AME and say, "Hey, what's the story on this one? Is it about to be approved? Is it okay? Uh, is there a substitute I could take instead?" Uh, the best thing is just try not to take any sort of drugs or medication, right. and, uh, and of course teach the our young student that don't drink and fly. <laughs> don't drink the same day you're flying. Right. You know, and you have that eight hours bottle throttle point oh four limited anyways. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Okay, uh, let's talk about scuba diving. So the mm-hmm. effects of nitrogen excesses that occur during scuba diving, how would that affect pilots or passengers? So uh, you want to make sure that your students, um, that if they're scuba diving, it seems like a lot of pilots scuba dive too for some <laughs> reason. Like we like to go up and we like to go down. Mm-hmm. Um, we're just not comfortable at the surface. Uh, but uh, teaching the student when they have passengers that scuba dive or if they themselves scuba dive, most divers are well aware of this, but typically we say don't fly within 12 hours of a dive and don't fly within 24 hours of a dive if it was a deco dive. So if you had deco stops on the way up uh, or it was a very deep dive, uh, as you climb an altitude, that nitrogen could come out of your blood and give you the bends. Mm-hmm. So you could be fine on the ground, start climbing and could have some really serious problems. Uh, Scuba divers also have their timetables that calculate the time till it's safe till they fly. And it's important to understand how cabin altitude relates to that because most of those dive watches will tell you, oh, you only need 17 hours till you can go fly, not 24. But that's taking into account usually an airliner which has an 8,000 foot cabin altitude max. Mm-hmm. And we could easily have a cabin altitude of 10, 11, 12,500 feet uh, in our airplanes, which is a lot higher and mm-hmm. a lot less pressure. So. Uh, taking that into account, basically just give yourself a lot of time between the dives and the flying. Good. Okay. So how long will our students' medical be valid? Uh, the student's medical, uh, say I sent him for a first class med. Mm-hmm. He's 15, so he's under 40. Uh, it would be a first class for a year, and then he would have four years of uh, third class privileges. Still a first class med, just third class privileges. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I sent him for a second class, he would have the year of the second class, four more years of third uh, level, and then for some for the third, you'd have the five years, 60 mm-hmm. months. Uh, okay. 60 calendar months is how long. Okay, yeah. good. Um, and the student pilot certificate is valid for? Uh, now with the plastic card, if that's what we're giving them, then it is indefinite, it does not have an expiration date. Okay. So what does our student need to have with him when he flies solo? So he would need to have his logbook with him, mm-hmm. with the endorsements in it. The paper logbook works like it has for the last hundred ish years, mm-hmm. uh, or digital logbook works now too. Since a lot of people, I really recommend my students keep both, uh, just for backup sake. And as they add more and more time, it becomes easier to deal with an electronic logbook. Right. Uh, so they need the logbook with them. They need the endorsements. Uh, they're going to need the student pilot certificate, uh, some sort of photo ID, their medical certificate. Uh, and aside from you know, all the other aircraft documents, that would pretty much be it. Okay. Um, so what needs to be part of the pre-solo written test? The pre-solo written test uh, is kind of spelled out for us in 6187 Bravo. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit vague how they spell it out for us, <laughs> but basically applicable parts of 61 and 91 and what's contained there within 6187 Bravo. Make sure you hit all those key points uh, with your questions. You have them fill out the test, take it home, work on it, open book, bring it back in. You go over any answers, you correct it to 100% with them, you sign it off, you know, that you both correct it to 100%, you give them the endorsement on the logbook, and uh, that's uh, that's the extent of the pre-solo written. Okay. So what do you need to train the student on before allowing them to go solo? 
Uh, before allowing them to go solo, uh, Part 61 spells out for us the bare minimum training we have to give them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a few extra things I like to do uh, with students that I think it's important for them to see. But uh, at a bare minimum, 6187 tells us taxi takeoffs, landings, go arounds, collision avoidance, uh, airport traffic patterns, climbs, turns, descents, the basics, basically. Mm -hmm. Any emergency procedures? Emergency procedures, everything contained within 6187, okay. Charlie. Good. Yeah, we can always go look it up. Good. All right. Um, so let's move on. Uh, after your student gets their certificate, if they don't fly for a few years and need a flight review, then what would you do? And they come to you for that. Um, so say they haven't flown in a few years. Uh, I would get into 6198 um, as an advisory circular that mm -hmm. is basically you know remaining proficient and current. Uh, talks a little bit about flight reviews. There's an FA document entitled "Conducting an Effective Flight Review" mm -hmm. uh, that I would review uh, to make sure I set up for the flight review right. Assign them some homework, some study material. Really try to figure out what type of flying they're doing or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. uh, what type of flying he wants to be doing if he's getting back into a training current again. Is he trying to go cross country a whole bunch? Is he trying to just be a weekend warrior in the pattern? Uh, does he want to upgrade to faster aircraft, tailwheel aircraft? What is it that he's trying to do? And cater the flight review to that. Yeah. Minimum one hour on the ground, one hour in flight uh, per 6156 maybe. And uh, it's probably gonna be, you know, if, uh, after three years, probably gonna be many hours on the ground, you know, several hours in the air. And there's no such thing as like failing him, it's just, if he doesn't complete the flight review, you simply log it as, you know, did part of the flight review and we mm -hmm. got a little more to do yet till good. I'm comfortable signing him off. Okay, good, all right. Okay, so that's good. Let's talk a little bit about uh, visual scanning and collision avoidance. Okay. okay. Uh, so you can tell me how you might teach visual scanning and collision avoidance, the different areas you might cover. Sure, okay. um, I've got a little bit of a lesson plan pulled up here okay. uh, for that, so. Uh, say we've got, uh, first thing we could talk about would probably be visual illusions. Mm -hmm. So we could ha talk about, uh, you know, any sort of uh, illusions looking at another aircraft when there's two approaching head on. Typically, if you're on a collision course, <coughs> that's wings on a fuselage, by the way. <laughs> if you're on a fuselage, if you're on a collision course either here or head on with another aircraft, there's going to be no relative motion between you and the other airplane. It's going to seem almost as you're kind of still in space. It just seems to be getting bigger in the windscreen. Would be a big clue that you're on a collision course with them. When you have an aircraft, uh, two aircraft approaching each other, just like when you pull up to a four-way stop, the one on the right has the right of way. So if you're this guy, he has the right of way, and you're supposed to either turn before him or turn to the left or somehow get out of his way because he has the right of way. Mm -hmm. Now. At the end of the day, you see, you avoid, and the key word is you avoid, you do whatever the heck it takes to not hit each other. Mm -hmm. If you're approaching head-on, they say, oh, their craft should turn to the right, which results in not hitting each other. But again, don't hit the other airplane, regardless of what the rules say. Make sure you steer a course. You, you'll be expecting both to turn that direction. If he somehow turns into you, whatever, make sure you don't hit the other airplane. A great thing to do when you see another airplane and you're worried about a collision course is just slow down mm -hmm. and buy yourself some time. If you're doing 140 knots, slow down to 70 or 80 knots. That just doubled the time. You know, slow down from 140 to 100, give yourself 25, 30% more time to deal with the situation. Uh, proper visual scanning procedures, we can kind of break the sky up into sections, mm -hmm. so little 10 degree sections, and just look out there and kind of look at one for, you know, half a second, a second, and then shift your eyes, look at another, look at another, look at another, and just keep working your way across. Occasionally that scan will come back into the cockpit, into the instruments, where you have your nice six pack down there. <laughs> uh, and you'll be looking at that. But keep scanning around and look around you as much as you can. Try not to move your head a ton if you don't need to, but of course, crank your head around and look. Uh, don't use a sweeping motion, just kind of turn your head and move your eyes then. But when you're flying just straight and level, for the most part, you'll just be moving your eyes and shifting them, but absolutely, by all means, move your head around. And every piece of available glass or plexiglass around you, uh, every piece of available real estate, try to check that okay. and see what you can see for other aircraft. Uh, as far as um, basically poor visual scanning and increased collision risk, a uh, big thing that 
will happen is you just won't scan constantly because mm -hmm. it gets tiring. You'll do it for 10 seconds, a minute, five minutes. Eventually you just lock on to one thing. You lock on the instruments, you lock on to one section on that horizon and you're just flying because when you're driving down the interstate, you're not constantly scanning around you. You're just maintaining your lane. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not great because you won't have situational awareness of what's going on around you. Most midair collisions occur with you know, some sort of sideways impact. They're very rarely head on. Mm -hmm. So the guy that's going to hit you or that you're going to hit, you're probably not gonna see him if you're just looking straight. Right. Uh, it always seems to be something that comes from the side. So maintaining that scanning technique during the day and especially at night, um, at night we're looking more for lights than we are for actual airplanes and trying to understand the difference between when we have an aircraft if you have, do you have any boating experience? Years ago when I was little. Okay, uh, well, port, starboard, whatever it might be. So uh, on our aircraft, we have the uh, red light on the side and the green light on that side. Uh, we have a white light on the tail and then we have a beacon, you know, sometimes on the belly, sometimes on the top of the tail. But if we see, a, you know, red, a green, a white, and they're probably going away from us. Or if we just see only a white and a red flash, it's probably the beacon and the tail, they're going away from us, or we're overtaking them. If we see the red and the uh, and the white light, you know, or the red, a flashing red and a white light, they're probably passing from right to left. So trying to understand how we can see that in three-dimensional space, and that's a written test question that mm -hmm. the student would want to pay extra attention to mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, private pilot written. Uh, as far as uh, talking about you know, speed differential. We said one of the great things we can do is just slow down. Mm -hmm. When we have two airplanes flying about 120 knots, kind of typical 172 or Sirius SR20 speeds, two guys flying 120 knots at each other, they're both on two miles a minute. Mm -hmm. So that would be, you know, four miles a minute uh, closure rate. And that gives you about 15 seconds if you're a mile away. Then there's 15 seconds before they would meet. Now again, they're, it's really head-on, so it's a little bit slower than that, but seeing an aircraft from a mile, usually you can see it, but if it's out of the corner of your eye, you may not notice it until it's a half mile or a quarter mile, and that's where the speed factor comes in. As you fly high-performance airplanes, higher-performance airplanes, um, they go faster, things are happening a lot faster, closure rates are much greater, and it's something to take into consideration of why we like to train in slower airplanes, just a little bit easier in that mm -hmm. sense. Okay. Um, Greatest collision risk we could probably find in the traffic pattern, uh, near airports, mm -hmm. and on very clear sunny days. Okay. It's not like low visibility is going to prevent us from seeing another aircraft because we shouldn't be flying in half mile vis anyways. <laughs> so if we're flying in three miles, five miles, six miles of vis, we should still be able to see the other airplane a mile away. And that low visibility, lower light may actually help us notice the lights on the aircraft. Mm -hmm. and that's why we always run with our landing lights on, our taxi lights on, below 10,000 feet, they're LED, we just keep them on all the time. We try to keep the strobes on all the time. And if it's at all reduced visibility, you turn on the nav lights, and especially at night. For uh, flying you know, in clear days, it's just that everyone likes to fly on a clear day. So mm -hmm. there's a lot more airplanes in the air, and a little higher risk of collisions there. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, so now let's talk about runway incursions, what, what you might teach your student about that, how to avoid those. Sure. Uh, so with runway incursions, there's a number of things we can do uh, to try to avoid them. One of the great things we have are taxiway diagrams on our iPad. So we mm -hmm. actually can pull up Garmin Pilot, ForeFlight, uh, a number of different EFB providers, or we can see a geo-reference plate, meaning we can see the aircraft on the taxi chart as we're taxiing around the airport. Mm -hmm. So we know right where we are. The problem with that is the iPad is usually here on my lap, <laughs> on my kneeboard, mm -hmm. and I'm steering the airplane like this and mowing down taxiway lights as I go, <laughs> or not really recognizing that there's a whole short line or something in front of me. Mm -hmm. So mounting the iPad in an appropriate location or being able to have some sort of you know short-term photographic memory, mm -hmm. look at the come to a complete stop, look at the chart, understand where you are what your next few steps are okay i'm going there's that you know sign to turn right on bravo there i'm just gonna go straight turn right on bravo and i'm gonna you know come to a stop and look again or or from there i know my way i can follow the directional signs mm -hmm. to the runway uh 
that way you're not looking down mm -hmm. and taxing the airplane. You should never have your eyes anywhere but outside in the aircraft moving on the ground. There's really not any sort of engine or airplane instruments that are useful when we're on the ground or that need attention on the ground when the aircraft's moving and your iPad doesn't need any attention when the aircraft's moving. So mm -hmm. it's a great tool just when it's used properly. Yeah. The other thing would be if you're unsure of where you're at on the airport to simply request progressive taxi instructions at an unfamiliar mm -hmm. airport mm -hmm. and let them walk you through how to navigate around there. Uh, not that you want to rely on that everywhere you go, but it's a useful tool to put into practice when you need it. Mm -hmm. uh, a useful tool to have in your back pocket. So what's a hotspot? Uh, a hotspot is going to be basically a place where someone has messed up before. Okay. So we can look <laughs> at um, you know a taxiway diagram here. Uh, let's see if we can pull one up. We can see here like Chandler, Arizona has mm -hmm. a hotspot right there. Mm -hmm. And the idea with that is it maybe just looks confusing on the ground. There's a lot of intersections, a lot of things happening in that one area. It's confusing what taxiway to take out of that area. There's you know maybe multiple taxiways coming out. And basically it's a place other people have messed up mm -hmm. and they've been messing up so much in fact, they decided to make it a little red circle on the, uh, on the chart. So a great thing to do is when we're on the ramp and we call for taxi and we get our taxi instructions, to actually mark out with your finger the route you're going to take on the uh, chart. And when you notice that's crossing hotspots, brief it and say it out loud to the instructor or say it out loud to yourself that hey, you know, there's a hot spot here and we need to pay extra special attention, slow down in that area, double check where we're going, come to a stop and ask. Uh, you know, there's a high risk of getting on the wrong taxiway or possibly crossing a runway that could be active. Good, okay. Um, so talk about some procedures for steering, maneuvering, maintaining taxiways and, and runway position and situational awareness. Uh, the best way I would describe that uh, would be looking outside, mm -hmm. uh, staying, not getting distracted by the instruments inside the airplane. Definitely not ever looking at like a cell phone. A cell phone should be off in silent mode. It's okay to leave it on in case of emergency. It's a great communication tool, but it shouldn't be on vibrate. It should just be on silent. Mm -hmm. So you won't be wondering why it's vibrating or what kind of awesome notification or who <laughs> posted one on Instagram just recently. <laughs> Uh, you want to have all those distractions totally eliminated. Mm -hmm. So another thing that could be distracting would be passengers, making sure that they understand that taxing on the ground is a very intensive time mm -hmm. and taxi takeoff landing are probably some of the most intensive times in the aircraft cruise flight, a little more relaxed. So yeah, maybe they can chit chat cruise flight, but you might want to brief, Hey, when I'm taxing on the ground, not a great time to be talking to me or have a conversation between yourselves that's distracting to me. Mm -hmm. So, and always tell them if you see something wrong, say something. You know, if you see like, I'm going to be head on with another aircraft that's on this taxi I'm about to turn on to and you know, I didn't notice them, say something before I do it and speak up. Uh, if you're flying with another pilot, use them, you know, to, mm -hmm. hey, so you see something, say something. And by all means, step on the brakes if you see something you don't like. You know, there's two brakes on either side of the airplane, so use them. Good. Okay. What's the relevance or the importance of hold short lines? Or hold lines, I should say. Uh, the hold short lines, uh, trying to understand that how they're drawn out for mm -hmm. students, uh, or for students, for hall pilots, is basically two solid lines and then the dashed lines. Mm -hmm. uh, dashed, you should be able to cross no problem. If they're solid, you probably really want to have a good reason for crossing them. <laughs> like, you were cleared to cross them. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, non-tower airports, you'll still find hold lines. Mm -hmm. They're great to stay behind because they give us adequate clearance for landing aircraft uh, or aircraft taking off when we're you know not ready to, to get into the runway yet. It's a great thing to use to make sure your tail is clear of the runway once you get off uh, the runway or you exit it. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely, if this is the runway itself, cross and turn off onto the taxiway without any sort of AT cle ATC clearance to get off the active runway onto the taxiway and then just come to a stop and your tail's clear here. Don't taxi any further until you get taxi instructions and be really aware if there's another line here because maybe you have parallel runways mm -hmm. and you might be like, okay, I got my tail across. What's this line and get confused and forgot that you ever saw this one. You may think that's the actual line you're looking for. Be really aware of the dashed versus solid lines and what that 
means to us as to where we're at on the airport environment. Okay. Um, how would you handle it if there was a vehicle moving around on the airport? Uh, so vehicles on the airport, if they're airport vehicles, they're supposed to know that anytime there's an airplane moving around, they, they get out of the way and they come to a stop and they wait for us to pass. They're just mm -hmm. not a distraction to us. They usually have bright flashy lights on them, mm -hmm. uh, which helps us identify them. But the, uh, if there's a vehicle, you just have to assume that it's someone who's not experienced or it could just be some driving with their hangar. So if there's any doubt in your mind, just come to a stop and wait for them to pass. Mm -hmm. um, if they're on a movement area, then tower, if it's a towered airport, they should know something about it. You could always query ground and ask them, you know, where is this truck going? And if you see something, I mean, you're taking off and landing and you see a truck that, you know, may cross onto the runway or is crossing on the runway, then just simply go around mm -hmm. and, you know, do everything you can to maintain distance between you and other aircraft and you and other vehicles or anything that's going to ding up the airplane. Good. Okay. Um, let's see here. Maybe discuss a little bit about the ATC communications as you would expect uh, mm -hmm. with the pilot before takeoff and before landing and after landing at towered and non towered airports. So, what might, might your 15 sure. year old expect to hear? So, <laughs> uh, we would train them kind of separately, right? So we would, mm -hmm. you know, take, I have a lesson plan for non-towered airports okay. and for towered airports. And those lesson plans both have parts for communication. You would want to role play with your student at, at both, you know, scenarios, role play the non-towered communications. They're usually a little simpler than the towered ones. Uh, and then also role play, maybe play the part of ATC and have the student play his part and role play before you get into the airplane, sitting in the ground during the briefing, mm -hmm. what kind of communications you're going to make. Make all those same exact ones that you as a CFI know exactly what the tower is going to say. Mm -hmm. If you're going to an airport you're familiar with, whether you're departing from that airport or you're flying to one to go get some tower airport experience, you know exactly what they're going to say at every single moment, what to expect based on the winds, what runways they're using. So use that to your advantage, teach the student, uh, let them role play and say those exact words with you. Uh, if you wanted to get really technical as far as what they're supposed to say, each towered airport and certainly areas of the country have their own culture. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to. There's JO 711.710.65, and that's on rendition F or G or H, <laughs> whatever might be the most current rendition on the FAA website. And that is a 700 page document of every single thing that ATC is supposed to be saying ever and how they're supposed to maintain separation between aircraft. It's their far aim, so to speak. It's right. their operations manual. So we could refer to that if we wanted the really technical book answer, but each area of the country kind of does things that's slightly different and it's sort of up to us as CFIs to know about that uh, mm -hmm. and know how it works in our local area. And we can always pick up the phone and call another CFI if we're taking someone on a real cross-country flight from Georgia to California and call some other CFIs along the way and get some insight how things work over there. Mm -hmm. If there's some quirks we should be aware of. Uh, like I said, everyone should follow standard manuals, but everyone's human too. Yeah. Yeah. So how would all of these procedures work at night? What would be the difference that we might expect? So at night, uh, everything's going to be very similar aside from the fact that at a non terror airport, we'll probably be controlling the lights. Okay. And it's a great teaching tool to the student to let the lights turn off right when they're about to land or right when they're taking off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's not a way for us to turn off the lights typically, but if we can get that timing right where we can click them on for them and they line up on the runway and they all turn off right before they add the power, that's a great learning experience mm -hmm. for them to always remember that when you're on short final or you're crossing the whole short line takeoff, you click those lights to the desired intensity to refresh that 15 minute or so timer mm -hmm. to keep them on so that doesn't happen to you. Right. Uh, at a towered airport, you could ask for lighting intensity to be changed. You could use slang, so to speak, that you'll want to teach the student that's part of our night flying lesson plan is kill the rabbit or mm -hmm. turn off the rail, uh, turn off the reel, mm -hmm. and ask for those different things. Um, there's lots of slang terms. You want to teach them the proper ones, they'll probably pick up the slang on their own. Right. Uh, but things like if that rabbit is distracting to you, if the reel is distracting, mm -hmm. if the runway lights are too dim or too bright, uh, runway lights that are too bright often result in us flaring too high. If they're right. too dim, we'll plow it right into the ground. Mm -hmm. So 
basically understanding the difference between you're controlling the lights or the tower might be. Okay, good. All right. Um, what would we do with low visibility operations? So low visibility operations uh, at a towered or non-towered airport in regards to uh, basically runway incursions, mm -hmm. uh, we would, same thing as we always do, taxi with the chart out, brief it, just taxi lots slower. Okay. Uh, hopefully for us starting out as a private pilot, <clears throat> we're not going to, low visibility might be like six or eight miles. <laughs> uh, so we're not getting into that low of visibility. Mm -hmm. uh, if I got my double line, I was teaching, you know, to be taking off in at minimums a 200 and a half or, mm -hmm. or maybe, you know, 400 and a mile. And we're taking off in low visibility like that. We could use things like smink charts that really detail for us the low visibility taxi routes where they have those green lights on the taxiway lines. Mm -hmm. Very few small airports have that available to us. Uh, we could have the lights turned up brighter. And the, big, the best thing is just go a lot slower, really brief the taxi diagram. And if it's six or eight miles and the tower can help you, they can see you. Mm -hmm. If it's one of those instrument type scenarios, the tower may not be able to see you and you, uh, you know, may not be able to use progressive taxi instructions or something like that. Okay, good. All right, so that is the end of this session of the CFI oral exam. We'll pick it back up in the next video. If you're looking for a good place to be a CFI, well, look no further than Lufthansa Aviation Training USA, Goodyear, Arizona. Great airplanes, great place to work, great benefits, and really good place to build your time or to become a career CFI. So thank you so much to them for making this video series possible. We will see you guys in the next video series. Now there's a little bit delay in these coming out here on YouTube. So if you're looking for these videos to come out a little bit faster, well, click on the link below and that will direct you to LufthansaAviationTrainingUSA.com, their website. And you can find this complete series available there on their website. Other than that, we will see you guys in the next session.